Okay, it's recording. Hi guys, welcome to our second interview. We'll be talking to Austin today. He's a propulsion analyst and he's gonna tell you about his career and what brought him to it. Would you like to tell us a little bit about why you chose your job and just about it? Yeah, absolutely. So my job is basically helping the design cycle of for rocket engines at Blue Origin. What I do is I guide designers in the process. They come up with pump designs, nozzle designs for rocket engines, and they convey the designs to me. I run math simulations on these parts and tell them if it's going to work in flight and be safe for humans to travel on. And I, I didn't really choose this job. It kind of chose me, just uh, fell into my lap throughout going to try to become an engineer and then opportunities came up and I ended up in space. Awesome. Well, can you tell us about how many years you've been working on your current job and how many years are you hoping and planning on working in the same job or does your job change? Yeah, I've been working on rocket engines for three and a half years now. And before that I was doing um, helicopters and airplanes and I my job role hasn't really changed and I don't plan on leaving Blue Origin anytime soon. As far as uh, rocket engines go though, the future is just kind of opening up because as a, as a human race, I think our, our next um, big step, evolutionary step, is progressing out of where we started. And Blue Origin is named after Earth, so it is our Blue Origin. And that's kind of what we believe is that we're going to branch out from our Blue Origin into space. And as far as opportunity and continued growth in this career, I think it's uh, limitless. And we need a bunch of new generations of people to help us keep working towards this goal. Uh, but I, I'm always open to new opportunities. And I think it's a great mindset to always be open to new opportunities because it, you have, or, or I try to keep in objective goals, but keep them loose. You know, don't always say like, I have to do this one thing and, or it's not gonna work out for me. You know, when new opportunities come up, be open to them for sure. So as of now, I plan on staying a lot longer, but if uh, new things come up, um, I'm flexible. Did you always see yourself in a job like this? You said it fell into your lap. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, kind of goes back into what I was just saying. I, I, my whole life I had this plan of where I wanted to be, what I wanted to do, how I wanted to do it. And I think everybody does in a, in a way, and we all follow it. And I think being flexible was one of the best things that happened for me. A great learning experience that happened for me was just saying yes to opportunities as they came up. And I actually was asleep in Kentucky on a Sunday morning when I had a text message asking me if I wanted to move to Los Angeles to work on rocket engines. And I said yes. And three weeks later, I was in Los Angeles. Um, so it it was exciting for me. I had never seen myself as being a rocket engine analyst or working on anything like that. I could see myself having worked on some space program eventually, but um, in engineering, it's really hard to kind of know what the jobs are until you get into the field because it's such a broad, broad field. Like you hear aerospace engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineer, chemical engineer, but you don't really know what that entails when you're a young student. And there's so much you can do. And in my official role as a structures and dynamics analyst, I didn't even know that existed <laughs> when I was in school. So um, that fell into my lap when I graduated college. Someone was like, you want to try to do structural analysis? I said, sure. I saw the, um, the benefit in learning analysis. And then 10 months later, I had worked hard enough and gotten enough experience to where they pick, I got picked up by Rocketdyne in LA. And Rocketdyne is the company that actually did the Saturn V rocket for the moon landings and the space shuttle engines. And so it was, a, you know, it's a historic company. I was really excited to work for there. And then, but I, I see the future of space at Blue Origin. And they, uh, I actually tried, I, cause I, I saw my hobbies aligning with Seattle and that's where Blue Origin is. And I tried to get into Blue Origin once and I got rejected. And then I tried again and eventually they, they actually, 
I can't remember if they reached back out to me or I reached back out to them a second time, but eventually a year later after being rejected, came back around and uh, I ended up there. So I'm here to stay for a while. So just hearing from you that the first time you tried, you did get rejected. What is your advice for students who maybe don't think they can make it into something, maybe have been rejected themselves from opportunities that they thought were essential for them to you know, move, in, move on in what they want to do someday when they grow up? Yeah, uh, look, I have failed probably as many or as much as anyone else. Um, I have so many failures under my belt and I'm not ashamed of them. Um, you, it, honestly, it makes you better for it. it. It's great if you can go without failing, but what, what's really cool is being able to fail miserably and then in your head tell yourself, there's still a pathway there. That's just not the one I wanted to take and forcing your way through it. And I'm proud of that. Um, advice, be a hard driver. Just don't let people tell you no. If, if someone tells you no, if you'll find someone else that'll tell you yes and they go up, go past them. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard and it can be really, hearing no is emotionally distressful no matter how much um, you want to tell yourself it's going to be okay. But I can, uh, from my experience, which may not be that much, but over the past uh, four years, it's been um, hard lessons learned through failures, but they come out to be great opportunities. So just don't give up. And anything, no problem. I, I just want to add on to that. Anything that seems rough at the present time, think about it. Always try not to think about it in your immediate situation. Just step back. Think about what it took you to get to where you are. Most of the time when you're at the point of a failure, you've already done a lot of good to even get to the opportunity of being rejected for something you wanted. So it's kind of one of those shoot for the stars, land on the moon thing, but eventually you go around the moon and into the stars. So. Well, I think that's great advice for all of the students. Can you describe to me your typical day um, prior and post pandemic? <laughs> uh, prior pandemic, I would wake up, um, always would, I'd get to the office around 5 a.m. by choice. You don't have to do that. I, we, have a, we have a gym at the office, so I'd get there at 5 a.m. I'd work out and shower and then be at my desk by 6. And at 6 a.m., I'd normally start checking emails. That's just something you're going to get to do at any job you have. You're going to have a lot of emails to go through. So um, after that, I normally have team meetings where I meet up with other component designers for the rocket engine. So we have... I, I do the failure analysis of mechanical components, but we have systems analyses, um, engineers, we have um, actual manufacturing engineers, we have component designers, we have project engineers, managers, we have technicians that actually physically build the engines, and we all get together and meet up, see where things are at, and come up with status reports on everything, decide what, what is the most critical action item to get to future engine tests and deadlines. And after that, I get to my desk and I start working math models on um, components that come to me. And this can vary widely day to day what I'm actually working on. But uh, anything on the engine is fair game. And what I technically do as far as determining if something's going to fail or not, the theory applies to anything inside and outside of rocket engines. I mean, even the, the desk here you're currently sitting in, somebody, somebody did analysis on it somewhere. But that's what, that's what my day, day flow typically looks like. And do you ever have to work on the weekends? Is that something typical in your field? So it's very typical in space program to have to work on the weekends. But as a analyst, um, specifically a structures and dynamics analyst, you get out of having to do a lot of the weekend and overtime work. Well, you still have to do overtime when, when you're coming up on deadlines. But there's not a lot that would be, um, let's say it's the day before a rocket launch. What can happen is a lot of people will get called in to fin do last minute things before a rocket launch. But as a structures and dynamics analyst, most of your work has been done. So unless 
the only time I had ever get called in on the weekend is if something went very, very wrong. Like we're getting ready to launch a rocket and in the five hours to 10 hours before the rocket launch, maybe 24 hours, we found maybe a crack on a part. They'd call me in um, and I'd have to be there all night doing analysis on that part to determine if the crack is going to run or something. But nowadays it's not like, uh, it's not like 40, 50 years ago where they would just seal it up and say, all right, good to go. Most of the time we just scrub the launch and say, we'll go at a later date. So most as a analyst, most of the times, no, you want to work on the weekend unless you volunteer too, which you can volunteer too. <laughs> well, the day before launch working sounds like that would still be pretty exciting. Yeah. It's not the, it's not the worst thing to, to go in and say, that's what you're working on. Yeah. All right. So did you know you were going to do this job when you were middle school age? When, if not, then when did you figure out that this was the area you wanted to go into? Yeah, I, I figured out, um, as, I, as I talked a little bit earlier, I figured it out when I got the text message when I was uh, laying in bed on a Sunday morning if I wanted to work on rocket engines. Um, and then it, it took me about a year into it to decide that this is what I want to do as a middle schooler and before that I definitely had the thoughts of I want to I like planes I like cars I like building things and uh, I'd like to be an astronaut stuff like that I, I never really had a a super owned in plan as a middle schooler of I want to be a structures and dynamics analyst on, on um, rocket engines and that's that's hard to know but Again, just big goals, keep them, keep them roomy and open for new opportunities. Like set your goal, like for your degree, what do you want your degree to be? Think about your options for that degree. If you even want to go through a degree, there are ways to get to point B without them too. Uh, but um, especially, well, I'll talk about that in a little bit, but um, pick, pick a big broad plan and then the, the details get filled in for you with life. If you work towards something, life has a funny way of uh, opening doorways for you that you didn't even know existed. That's true. So are there very many openings in your type of job or the jobs around you um, in your field? And do you think that there will be a large amount of jobs in the future as these students are growing up? Is it a growing field? Yes, there are always a lot of jobs in structural analysis and dynamic analysis roles as an engineer. It's one of those staple jobs that no matter what is being built, when it's being built, um, economic recession, economic expansion, there are always, there's always a need for it. And there aren't a lot of us in the, in the market either, but, um, you can go on any job listing website and look up structural analysis and there are always just hundreds to thousands of listings. So it's not really a problem if you're, but you have to be willing to, to move around for it sometimes for sure. <laughs> you can't always get the places you want, but um, yeah, I, I, I don't see it going away either. It's kind of a new, a newer science. Engineering as a whole is kind of new. So what we do as engineers is we're taking um, fundamental sciences that have been developed for hundreds of years. And then about 50 years ago, someone decided, 50, not 50, 100 years ago, someone decided let's actually start applying this in our own ways that make it more functional for the day-to-day -day use. And um, structural analysis is only about 50 to 70 years old in, it, in its current form. And as computers developed, it changed. As new theories are more well understood, it keeps changing. So it really is a growing science, and there's a lot we still don't understand. Uh, sometimes I, I'm making guesses on these really intense components that are going to space, and you're like, I don't really know <laughs> how I feel about this, but um, it's the best guess we have now. And um, so there's a lot of room for improvement, and there's definitely a need for more more people interested in it in the future, and always will be. And as far as um, the uh, economy right now goes, 
it still really hasn't slowed hiring of structural analysts or engineers as a whole. Well, that's good. We need the economy to keep moving and everybody to have jobs. So moving on to questions on education and training for this type of job. Does your specific job um, or kind of aerospace engineers as a whole require a high school, uh, community college, technical college, or for your uh, college education? And if there are different paths, can you tell us about them? Absolutely. So the simple answer is, is yes, you need a, a four-year engineering degree of some form. And once you have an engineering degree of some form, you can pretty much um, drive your way into most engineering roles if you can make a good argument for yourself. However, um, for roles like mine as a propulsion analyst, most of the people I work with have um, masters and PhDs. I, I don't, I only have a four year degree, but I had um, good work experience, which helped me get into the role. Now that for some might sound discouraging, like you have to go, have to plan to be a rocket engineer, go to grad school, get a master's degree, get a PhD. And that's not necessarily true either. Um, I, if you want to be in engineering, it's definitely advisable to get the four year degree and just start as baseline and see where things go from there. But there are other ways. If you, for some reason, can't or don't want to, don't have the interest to going to school immediately, there are two-year degrees that are engineering tech degrees, and you can get an engineering tech degree, land a job somewhere. In some companies, you work for five years uh, with an engineering tech degree, then you can land the same job I have if you can prove you do the work. So a good thing about engineering is if you, we're, we're pretty reasonable people when it comes to uh, demonstration of capabilities. So if you manage to get the capabilities of knowledge and experience that I have without having gone to college, for sure we're gonna hire you. We're not going to not hire somebody because they don't have the degree, but it's much, easy, much, much easier to just get the degree for sure. Um, other, other ways, and there are a lot of jobs in space now, out of the aerospace engineering um, aspect aside, there are job opportunities in business, finance, manufacturing, testing, and a lot of these jobs people don't know about don't require degrees either. And a lot of those people come in without degrees and they find out, wow, this is really cool. And they interface with the engineers and they're like, oh, I'd really like to try out their job. And they work as a, um, technician for three, four years, and then the engineering company will fund their way to go to college and become the engineer. So there's a lot of ways to, to go through it. And I've, it, it's a hard, it's a hard pathway, but um, if you want it, and maybe you don't know you want it when you're 18, because uh, it's not, it, it's not easy to go through an engineering program and not knowing it's really what you want to do and then going, making a halfway and then dropping out. That doesn't really help too much, but um, there's a lot of ways into the space program with or without a degree, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's still much better to just have it first, but we're not going to count you out for not. Of course. Well, it's good to know that students can find their passions late. They can go about different routes and that still there are pathways for them to be able to you know, get into this type of career. They're not counted out because they didn't make the decision early enough. Um, absolutely absolutely and uh, to add to that it's not there's no race to getting started on um on a career really we all we all are going to work for 30 plus years at some point so you can start that when you're 30 you can start that when you're 20 you can start it when you're 16 if you want to um but it's really okay to not do it right away if you don't know what you want to do but it's always better i like this phrase it's always better to have a bias for action so as long as you're doing something that is adding to your personal capital you're making positive growth towards your future so um ba basically what i'm saying is just keep working towards something that is value added whether you know it's what you want to do for sure or not keep moving forward and eventually you will find it. 
if something will come to you maybe and it'll just be a leap of faith you'll say yes to but you will find it great our next question is does your job change often and if so how do you keep your knowledge and skills updated you talked about the field continually changing and growing but yep. that could be a big one for you yeah well just my day to day job itself um I don't think I've done, it's been very infrequent that I've done an analysis the same way twice. So I've been working for three, three and a half years on rocket engines. And in the whole three and a half years, there has not been one analysis that has been exactly the same as a, a prior. And so the, the role in itself, having different, doing different components and having different loads for different components all the time makes it inherently change. and we're always peer reviewing and group checking each other because of that. Um, we're just looking for best educated guesses, essentially. And uh, so that in and of itself keeps things interesting. The, the fundamental theory is the same, but the way you apply it, there's a lot of, a lot of room for uh, wiggle, a lot of wiggle room for sure. Now to keep learning, the best resources I've found are definitely technical documents that, um, come out of research institutions for engineering because engineering books are great but they're um they're typically don't go deep enough into the theory of something that for you to really really get a, um, a understanding that's applicable to what you're working on in the real world it's really good to definitely read your engineering books and understand everything that's in them but when you go to apply it to, uh, let's say, uh, an oxygen pump on our, on the BE-7 engine, right? There's not going to be an example problem for that in your textbook, uh, or really much much close. You, you need a combination of, it's a combination of a bunch of textbook theories in one, one problem. And so you can actually find, uh, NASA is a great resource, because all NASA's information is public, too. They haven't, the, the NASA Technical Library is probably my go-to. And it's really interesting to read, even if, uh, even if you're not working on anything related, they just publish some really cool papers. Um, and they, for me specifically, will always have an exact application. Like I'm looking at something for a turbo pump, they've got papers about specific applications to a turbo pump. And I, I think you can find a lot of situations like that in, air, in the aerospace field where you're working on a problem, you don't really know what to do. It's uh, a combination of a lot of theories from a lot of textbooks. Look for a technical document. You'll probably find someone that has thought or ran into the same problem and tried to uh, quantify it with some type of empirical test. Um, and that's where I go the most. And then the other resources, asking questions, because there are always people that are a lot better than you <laughs> that have been doing it for a lot longer. And ask them questions or ask smart questions. It doesn't matter. Um, just make it known that you need help with something and most people want to help we uh we like helping people and we like teaching and i also encourage for for learning i like to teach too because when you teach something it seems that at least for me i retain a lot more information when i'm teaching something and i also understand things better when i have to explain it when you start explaining things to people you you write it down and you start explaining it and you're like, huh, well, why do I really think this? You know, why do I really believe this theory? And then you have to reason with yourself about, um, I guess you have to reason to yourself why you believe things that you normally would have never questioned. So to, to learn, I teach other people, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yes. It also sounds like your job takes a lot of creativity. You're saying you don't do the same algorithms twice all the time. You have to learn from putting a lot of different resources together. Um, do you think it takes creativity and kind of an art? Ab absolutely. And some people are more naturally inclined to be better at it. Um, I'm not one of those people that was just born better at it, I, but I, I definitely see the people that are just naturally creative and artistic in this way and they they can really um i just see the big picture so clearly without 
having to really dig in. I'm not one of those people. I really have to think about something before, um, before it clicks for me and that's okay. But, um, I, I think in a way the math itself is an art and I, I a lot of people I, I work with would agree to that. It, it really is a amazing what we're able to accomplish with it. That's true. All right. So questions on kind of working conditions and how your job is. Um, how many days a week um, do you work typically and what type of holidays do you get? Yeah. So as a structural structures and dynamics analyst, we have it pretty, pretty good when it comes to um, schedule, as I was saying about not really, not really having to work weekends all the time. Um, I, I've had it, over my career so far, I've had multiple schedules and um, the standard five days a week schedule. I've had every other Friday off and then I've had a schedule where I had every Friday off. I was still working 40 hours a week, every week, but um, the every other Friday off one was probably my favorite because you work, uh, it's called the 980 schedule. You work four nine hour days, then an eight hour day. So uh, you do a 44 hour week and then a 36 hour week. And on the 36 hour week, you get every the Friday off. So it's really nice. But um, as a structural engineer, you can really kind of dictate that when you go places. Um, when I came to Blue Origin, well, my deal, I didn't ask for more money when they made me the job offer. I just said, I want every Friday off. <laughs> and uh, they gave it to me. So um, I don't do that anymore. I, since we're working from home, I have been working every day because there's no point in me working four tens if I'm already home. But um, yeah, so the flexibility is nice. And there are also different ways about working. This applies to all of engineering and I guess the whole discipline. You can be a direct employee where you're on salary or you can be a contractor where you're um, being staffed. So as a contractor, you don't get any holidays, but you get paid more and you get paid by the hour. As a direct employee, which I am now, you get a salary. You don't get paid by the hour, so you, you kind of get take a hit on overtime sometimes, but um, you do get paid vacation. And right now I get a whole four weeks off front loaded. I don't have to earn it. At the first of the year, I just automatically have four weeks of vacation applied to my account and I can roll over, I think I can roll over two weeks. So technically I can have six weeks of vacation stocked up immediately in January, which is pretty good. And then um, as a direct employee, you normally in engineering, you normally get the whole week of Christmas to New Year's Eve off paid for plus the other, what is it? Six to eight government sponsored holidays. So there's a lot of time off for sure. Um, but as a contractor, the deficit is you make your own schedule, you get paid by the hour, but you don't get holidays, but you get paid more. So you can do either one. Well, I need to borrow some of your vacation time then. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, yeah, I'm sure you work a lot there. Well, student life and training is a different life than finally having your full job, but. <laughs> You'll get there. <laughs> so do you work with other people um, in your job or mainly by yourself? I know with being at home with COVID, it changes it a little bit, but how was it before? Okay, so this is where my job is, is kind of cool. Um, being being an analyst, you have to interface with everyone that had input into the design of any component. So let's say it's just a bolt. Sounds so simple, right? A bolt. People make their whole careers on bolts, you know? So uh, let's say I have to sign off a bolt for flight. It has to go through every signing authority. So every person before me has to sign off before it even gets to me. So I'm the last person to sign something and say, good to go. So to be able to sign something to say good to go, I have to interface with everyone before me. So for me to even do an analysis, I need, um, I need loads. So there, there's one group. I got to talk to the people that come up with the loads. I need the part, uh, the CAD, CAD model, computer-aided design model. And to do that, I need to talk to the designers. I need to talk to the thermal analysts because I need temperature profiles for the part. I've got to talk to fluid dynamics analysts because they come up with how the fluid flows through um, the parts I work on. 
and all of these come together. And then I also have to talk to the manufacturing engineers, say like, how's it going to be built? How's the surface going to look when it's done? Uh, these are all factors I have to account for. So I get to interface with a ton of people, but um, that is mainly just for getting inputs into my models. And um, they also come to me a lot because uh, if you go into engineering, you're going to find out you'll, you'll know structures because they're going to be the people you're complaining to about taking too long because <laughs> you'll be trying to get a signature from them. And uh, I'll be saying, no, I can't sign off yet. And so then I have all these people coming to me like, why can't you sign off on this yet? So yeah, I interface with people in that way. But as far as me doing my work, um, my tasks are solely done by me independently. And I work through my tasks unilaterally and then we'll peer review together. And then I, I can have support, but actually doing the analysis, it's better to just do it individually. It's really hard to do as um, divide and conquer. You, to the divide and conquer, you normally both individually take separate components and work unilaterally through those components by yourself. And then you'll flip your reports and read through them and say, okay, this makes sense or doesn't. So long-winded answer as yes, I, I get to talk to a lot of people, but my work I do more by myself. Okay. Yeah. Great. So our final category is just kind of questions about finances with your job. Um, how has your job been affected by the economy or how can it be affected by the economy? Yeah, so structural analysts always in demand, as I mentioned earlier, specifically because um, if you look around your room, anything that's in there has been touched by a structural analyst at some point. And that, it's just really wild to think about that the same concepts you use for rocket engines would be the same you use on that desk chair. <laughs> but um, obviously a different level of vigor, but it's still the same same theory. Uh, so there, there are always jobs. And I have seen pretty severe um, turns as far as con job contracts in my four years. And in those severe turns and like upticks and downticks in the market, I have seen hundreds of people been laid off. But that whole time, I've never seen a structural analyst be laid off. So that's, that's what I can say is that they're pretty, they're the last to go. If people do have to go, the structural analysts seem to be the last to go. And I've seen them continuously be hired even while other people are being laid off, which is kind of sad in one way, but <laughs> um, for the for the other people. But um, I, I'd say it's very stable. Now, as far as the space program as a whole being stable, that is a landscape that's kind of changing. Um, before it was government funded, NASA funding, and that was highly dependent on public opinion of space and how the senators and congress, congressmen and women thought space was appearing to the budget. You know, they, they could make one vote and the budget would be that you thought you had for 10 years is now slashed and everybody's getting shown the door immediately. But with people like Jeff Bezos, who owns Blue Origin, and Elon Musk, who owns SpaceX, these guys just really want to do this. There's no, they don't need any funders. They, they are their own investors. And um, so the landscape is changing because of them, because with or without NASA, we're going to space. And they have the, they have the ability to do it. And as long as they want to keep doing it, space will keep going. Um, I think right now we're in a unique time because space is kind of coming back around and starting to pick up again. We just had this year SpaceX put, um, put the first U.S. astronauts in space from American soil for the first time since 2011. And that was our first low Earth orbit designated crew vehicle ever in United States history. And Blue Origin, we're getting ready to put people in space beginning of next year, theoretically. Um, Virgin Galactic have put people in space this year. So we're, there's a lot happening. And come 2024, this is the goal. We want to put the first woman and next man on the moon in 2024. And NASA's behind this, too. So we've got the private sector and the government funding sector all in agreement on this 2024 goal. So um, that's kind of a 
big picture of the landscape of how the space space and economy goes together. It's highly variable, but it's becoming more stable because of the private industry. That's awesome. And I will be excited to see the first woman on the moon. Yeah, it's exciting. I think I know who it's going to be. Um, we'll, uh, we'll see. I think I know who it's going to be. I've, I've met her. She's, she's a very, very cool woman and crazy capable. Wow. I think our last question is, uh, what benefits do you receive in your job? Yeah, so um, uh, one of the, I guess this isn't really a benefit, but working in the space program, it's not a technical benefit that you'd see on an offer letter. Working in the space program, I do get to meet a lot of, um, a lot of astronauts. I've gotten to meet a lot of astronauts. They come by the facilities and, uh, you know, they come check out what they're going to be riding on and you get to talk to them. And it's been cool to have some one-on-one -on -one face time with astronauts and actually we have um at blue origin specifically we've got five space shuttle astronauts that actually work with us they're a part of the um part of the staff at blue origin so it's kind of cool um i i'm pretty i nerd out pretty hard with astronauts so <laughs> it's uh that's exciting for me but yeah as a as a engineer you're gonna get all the standard 401k matching sure that doesn't really matter to many of you yet but it will at some point um health health healthcare, um all the standard stuff but with startup companies something cool that you can get is equity so at startup companies now it's it's not super common but it is common if it's something you're interested in where they'll hire you in exchange for part ownership in the company and that's that's a really cool benefit so uh, that's something you might not see elsewhere. And that pertains to sm mainly smaller startup companies and uh, in space right now. And probably for the next 10 to 15 years, there will be a lot of startup companies offering that kind of benefit for sure. So that's something to look out for because not only but your normal benefits are cool, but when you have uh, part equity in the company, whatever they give you to start with at when you're working, um, for the company instead of just working to get paid you're actually working to get paid and working to better owner or better the company that you technically own part of so as you do better for the company you're actually doing better for yourself at the same time so it's kind of a cool concept it's a it's a newer newer benefit for sure that's great um, I think the last question which I have is are we going to Mars yeah we're going to Mars for sure um, are we going to all live on Mars? I don't know about living on Mars. I, I think it's a, a cool concept, but what I always ask people that want to go live on Mars is, what do you want to do there? I mean, uh, the only thing I can think about that would be fun, the only fun activity I can imagine you doing there is collecting rocks. And here's the problem. They're not even different rocks. They're all the same one, and they're all red. So <laughs> there's, not, there's not that much to do there. But um, I think we will get to Mars by 2030. So 10 years. Um, if we make it to the moon in 2024, I think we will make it to Mars in 2030. Um, and the, the moon landing in 2024, NASA is saying this herself, is 2024 or bust. And they're really serious about making 2024 happen. We'll see. Um, I think it's going to happen. And if it does happen, I don't know. There's a lot of companies involved, but... Uh, I'm excited for it because I, I know no matter what, when that those people, when those Americans set foot on the moon again, um, we whatever my team has worked on will have put them there, and that's a really cool feeling. Um, it's exciting, but what's more exciting is who makes it to Mars. And there are a lot of people trying for it. Um, there are. Yeah, that's that that's a long answer, but yes, we will go to Mars. Well, thank you for joining us today and telling us about your job. I'm sure everybody loved to hear it. Don't forget students to watch the lesson talking about aerospace engineering, as well as fill out your little three minute survey at the end to get credit for the course. Oh, hey, can I add something? Yes. Yeah, this is for the students. Um, if Can you see this? No. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I'll do this. There we go clubforfuture.org, okay? This is an organization we do. And if you go to that website, it has instructions on how you can 
fill out a postcard and mail it to us. And when you mail it to us, we will actually send it up to space in one of our rockets and we will stamp it once it gets back to earth with has been to space officially stamped on your postcard and we'll mail it back to you to keep. Um, I think the topic right now is why does, why do you think earth needs space? And so on the postcard, you just, you draw, you make a picture basically of your image of why you think earth needs space. And then we will actually send it to space. So it's kind of fun. I hope some of you do it and I'll make sure you get it back. That's great. We'll add that to the bio about this video as well as to one of the activities for aerospace engineering so that some of you guys can get to do it. So thank you for joining us, Austin. Yeah, thank you for having me. I hope, uh, hope to see everyone as coworkers someday. Don't forget to fill out the survey. Remember, you only have to fill it out once, either after the lesson, the interview, or the activity. This will only take you about two minutes and will give you credit for being a part of this exercise.